Hi and welcome to another episode of Research in Profile, brought to you by the School of Political Science and International Studies at the University of Queensland. My name is Sebastian Kempf and I'm joined here today by Dr. Emma Hutchinson. Emma is a researcher in the School of Political Science and International Studies and her research focuses predominantly on the topics of emotions and trauma with particular reference to security, humanitarianism as well as international aid. Mm. Emma, thanks for coming here. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And obviously we're having you here because you have just published your new book yep. with Cambridge in, uh, University Press's very prestigious international studies series. The book is entitled Affective Communities in World Politics, Collective Emotions After Trauma. Yeah. So congratulations on the book, no, first Thank you of very all. much. Um, it's an intriguing title, Affective Communities in World Politics. What got you interested in these topics? Yeah, so, so um, I guess ever since the start of my career, or really as an undergraduate and an honor student, I've had a long-standing interest in community in world politics, and in particular in how communities can be constructed um, in times of in human need. So um, humanitarian communities, I guess, was primarily what got me into trying to understand um, the concept of community, um, how communities are uh, constituted, um, whether it's within the state, at the state level, and also beyond the state. Um, and from there, I really got thinking about, you know, what is it that drives uh, the humanitarian impulse? What is it that, what is it that, that makes us, or makes us um, feel for people in times of human need? Um, how do we perceive of others suffering? And for me, that really came back to emotions and how we feel about, about suffering, about witnessing suffering. Um, so from there, I got thinking about, you know, well, what role do emotions play in, in binding us together, in pulling people together, and I guess also in constituting detachments between people. So, um, you know, from there, I started to embark and looked into literatures on emotions and affects in social and political life. Um, and the book, I guess, is an attempt to really draw together um, a very broad range of literatures from feminist theory, sociology, um, political theory, psychology, history, sociology, um, and many more disciplines in, in an attempt to try and understand, you know, how is it that or, or how do emotions and affects bind us together and what role do they play in um, constituting not just communities, but also a sense of responsibility and also, I guess, security communities after different types of catastrophe. Yeah. I mean, you already pointed to the wealth of these different mm. rich sources that, yeah. that go yes. through this book, and it's really impressive. And, but before we go in depth into yeah. all of these different topics, I actually want to draw our attention to the cover picture mm. that we it's have on the it's book. A, it's a wonderful cover, um, and I'm very grateful to um, an Australian artist, Ben Quilty, for giving permission for us to use his image. Um, this image is taken from a series of portraits that he did of returned uh, servicemen and women, Australian servicemen and women, who returned from Afghanistan. He was actually an embedded and the official war artist um, with the Australian Defence Force in Afghanistan, and he went and spent time with the troops. And when he returned, um, he decided or he undertook a study of, of um, servicemen and women who have had returned and he basically he asked them he wanted to do a portrait study and he asked the he asked them to pose in different positions that felt that they felt reflected how they feel how they feel after their service and predominantly that was one of trauma um, and they felt traumatized by their experience so many of the portraits and not actually the one that is featured on my cover which is of uh, Troy Park um, Many of the portraits are very literal, um, I guess very little representations of the body in pain. Many of, and, and um, we felt that this one was perhaps the most appropriate for the cover, but they're a wonderful series of portraits. And when I saw them, I just, I was really hopeful that I could, could have one on the cover, so. It certainly draws you in, mm. right? So I think, yeah, uh, great, well chosen. Mm. Now in the opening of your book, you write, and I quote that, Few phenomena in world politics are as central, mm. yet as mm. underexplored, as trauma and emotions. Mm. Why have emotions been absent mm. in our studies and scholarship oh about yeah. world politics? And why is that absence problematic? 
So traditionally, emotions have been um, have essentially been been demonised and, and expunged from political analysis, and this really emerges from a long tradition, you know, Western philosophy and political theory. Emotions um, were kind of the opposite of of good political reason and judgment, um, and it was emotions that precise is precisely what impels people towards violence and harm. So the thinking was that. Emotions essentially need to be taken out of the political equation. Um, emotions need to be, we need to set them aside and, and come up with, um, I guess, policy options and, you know, enact political behaviours that, that are, are rational and, and, and emotion free. Ironically, whilst also realising that, emo it's, that it's emo emotions are central to, um, to sometimes aberrant political behaviours, um, uh, it, it's ironic because it, you can't essentially take them out of the political equation. Emotions underlie, you know, emotions are an inevitable and inescapable aspect of human experience, and this is what my book shows. And um, it's because of that that we need to uh, we need to we need to sort of take them seriously and consider how they actually underlie, you know, all political perceptions, um, behaviours, and policy options. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Now, further down the book, you talk about the paradox mm. of trauma, the ability of trauma to, on the mm. one hand, break communities, but yeah. also to form yeah. communities. I think given how central this yeah. is to your argument, I'd like to ask you to um, elaborate a bit more on that. Yeah, so there's really key, two key aspects that are central to this paradox. On the one hand, um, a lot of literature, uh, particularly a lot of literature from psychology and emerging from post-Holocaust studies, you know, they contend that trauma is an isolating and solitary experience, that trauma, um, trauma detaches us from our social reality um, and it, it, you know, as Maurice Blanchot writes in The Writing of Disaster, trauma is, as he writes, it is, uh, it, trauma is what escapes the very possibility of experience. Um, Kathy Carruth, a, a very prominent trauma scholar, similarly says trauma is an experience that's strangely missed. It's something that we can never entirely comprehend. We can't, um, it's, it's ineffable, ineffable. It's something that we can't, um, we find it difficult to express, understand. And so trauma survivors often come back to, to the moment of their trauma in an attempt to understand it. But, but really key here is that trauma is seen as an isolating, solitary experience. It breaks communities precisely because it detaches you from the communal connections in which you're embedded. At the same time, <coughs> and we see it very often um, in, in politics, world politics, domestic politics, trauma, um, trauma can rally people together. People can be pulled together around pain, around others' pain, around witnessing pain. Um, so the paradox of trauma, this paradox is, is central to my research puzzle and so far that I try and understand this disjuncture and how is it that trauma can on one hand be isolating and solitary, um, emotionally ineffable perhaps, but at the same time can um, constitute communities so powerfully. Uh, so powerfully. So, and my contribution to sort of understanding this paradox and this puzzle is really to delve down the, the road of emotions and to say, like, how is it, like, what is it about the emotions of trauma um, that can seem perhaps to survive as so uh, individual and solitary, yet at the same time can seep out and constitute collectives um, and yeah, political communities? Great. Mm. So <coughs> if emotions matter, mm. then... Of course, one of the questions that people would ask or scholars would ask is like, okay, yeah. but how do we go about researching emotion, yeah. something that's so intangible in a way, right? Now, in your book, you point to uh, a lot of new and exciting scholarship that yeah. has started to embark on these mm. questions and you outline the kind of methods that they have um, embarked on. Mm. But you in your book, you have chosen a different path, namely that you study and analyze emotions through representations. Mm. So the question I want to ask is like, why is that? Why have you chosen mm. that kind of path? And what does such an examination actually look like? Mm. 
Yeah, so as you said, yeah, there's a lot of literature and particularly growing at the moment, looking at, you know, how it, recognizing that emotions are so important in social and political life. Um, you know, how is it that we go about studying them? Um, and there's a lot of debate, disagreement um, in this area. But, you know, as, as you said, my key contribution uh, lies in uh, proposing and I show how I think a study of representations can be helpful in moving debates forward. So it's not the only way uh, to go about studying emotions, but um, my study looks at uh, representation. So by that I mean um, the images, text, bodily gestures, any sort of symbolic practice or representational mode through which actions, and in my case trauma, is, is um, communicated. So representations essentially provide a vehicle or a medium um, through which, in my case, trauma is represented, trauma is, uh, sorry, communicated. Um, and representations, I argue, are key because they're, they're, they're precisely the way through which emotions are also communicated. So it's through representations, through the images and text we receive every day, that that's how we um, create meaning and uh, create emotional meaning and these different types of emotional meanings, they can act um, as, um, I guess they can act as catalysts or they can help to produce uh, the, the conditions through which um, particular political actions become possible. So um, the representations for me, um, you know, they're really, they really, they embody and enact emotions and they're really how we receive different emotional messages and how different um, events, ph political phenomena, they can gain emotional residence and in turn political credence. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that so much yeah. wonderful conceptual theoretical work is done by you in this book. When we look at the theoretical and conceptual part of the mm. book, which is very substantive. Um, and before we come mm. to the case studies, I want to get a bit of a sense of what the major mm. conceptual contributions of the book are. Um, so essentially, if I had to sum it up, I would say the book, um, the book shows how the emotional dimensions of representing trauma can constitute forms of political community at various different levels from the local to the global. Um, and by this, I essentially look at how different representations or representations of different types of trauma, they, they attain and attribute forms of social meaning. And, it, and they, in doing so, they create social and collective understandings. And it's these meanings and understandings, they can gain political traction, or I argue they gain political traction precisely through the types of emotional resonance they have. Um, it might, it, perhaps it might help if I, if I go into the case studies and explain yeah, how absolutely. this dynamic takes shape because more I think concretely. No, absolutely. Yeah. And I was, would have commended you on yeah. being like to the spot already on that particular yeah. hard question I just yeah. asked you. But let's, let's look into the cases. Mm. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, there's three case studies yeah. that you have chosen um, just for the sake of our viewers to be on the same page as us. Um, one is the Bali bombing mm -hmm. of 2002. The second one, the 2004 mm -hmm. Southeast Asian tsunami. And the third is um, China's so-called century of national humiliation. And actually the fourth, I have to correct myself, is South Africa's attempt to come to terms with its own traumatic experience mm. of apartheid. So maybe the first question here would be, why those four cases? Um, so to begin with, um, the four cases are used, well, I should say all of the cases to return to my key, I guess, theoretical, the theoretical contribution. All of the cases really show how again, the emotional dimensions of representing trauma can constitute communities. But I use these cases in very different ways, and I actually do use them in three different ways. Um, the first case, that of the Bali bombing in two 2002, in which 202 people were, were killed in Kuta, in Bali, um, 88 of, of whom were Australian. In this case, I'm looking at how the emotions associated with a national trauma essentially reconstituted or consolidated a previously existing and established community. So in this case, it was that of the sovereign state and the nation. And often we find it is, um, it is at the, the level of the nation. Um, 
And there are a range of different, so I trace in this um, how the emotions associated with um, media images and media texts um, con reconstituted the Australian national community or pulled them together, rallied them together around, um, around um, sentiments such as, you know, anger, fear, anxiety, grief. And I look at how um, after an, a trauma such as this, communities can sometimes be constituted, or they're often constituted, I would argue, in very insular, bounded ways. So, in essence, this is a type of trauma that closes off a form of community. Um, it closes off the boundaries, um, often creates and perpetuates us and them type of dichotomies, which can sometimes uh, orientate a community in, in retributive ways. Um, in this case, that it's not essentially the argument, but I do draw links between how uh, the Bali bombing constituted the Australian community and created a sense of solidarity that perhaps led to, um, to Australia's uh, involvement in the subsequent wars in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. And do you want to say a bit more about the other three cases as sure. well? Sure. So the second case, um, which is really uh, quite different, um, is a, I look at um, the trauma associated with the 2004 Southeast Asian tsunami. And the reason I chose this case um, originally is because I really wanted to look at, okay, so I'd looked at how a national community can be constituted, but my, you know, one of my key passions has been looking at how can we constitute um, and transform community beyond the nation state. So I thought at the time this, this was a really, uh, it, it might make an insightful case to study how is it that, you know, why, w what was it about the tsunami that mobilised such enormous transnational solidarity? At the time, it um, mobilised the largest uh, transnational aid community ever, um, constituted by um, nation states, international organisations and in individuals. Um, so in this case, I look at, um, again, media representations and associated texts, and I look at how, um, how essentially they helped to constitute or the role they played, the types of meanings and social understandings they, they created in order to mobilise it, to help mobilise the community. Um, and I focus in particular on Western media representations. Um, I looked at images, front page images of the New York Times, uh, in order to get a sense of, um, I guess, the emotional dynamics at state and the role they played in creating the conditions through which this aid community emerged. Um, and I found, um, at the time somewhat surprisingly, that in fact, um, even a newspaper such as the New York Times actually represented the tsunami through very um, stereotypical patterns of imaging developing world others. And in doing so, they really tapped into um, they tapped into to what's known as a politics of pity. Um, so they mobilised sort of Western viewers around, um, as I said, stereotypical understandings of developing world others, uh, developing world others as passive and powerless, in need of urgent aid, in need of need of the West's help. Um, and in doing so, there's particular political and ethical um, issues at stake. Um, on one hand, and what I hoped was what you'd find this community was uh, transformative and, you know, a revolutionary type of community that shows how people can be pulled together around, you know, empathetically around other people's pain. But then, on the other hand, given that it was uh, mobilised, the aid community was mobilised through such stereotypical depictions, it's somewhat... Um, uh, sobering, I guess, to think that um, it was actually, you know, mobilised through uh, pity and sympathy rather than, I guess, a more empathetic understanding of of how other people's experience disaster. So, so that was the second case, and the third case. Um, I hope I'm not taking too much time to get no, through these. No, it's fascinating. Um, the third case um, was added on uh, towards the end, and I'm. Really, I'm really, I'm happy with how it turned out. I hope readers are as well. It's possibly a little ambitious. I fear it's an ambitious chapter, but what I really wanted to do in it is think about, or you know, try and see, try and um, consider if there's ways of representing trauma uh, 
so and perceiving of trauma that can constitute communities in, in less retributive ways and in ways that sort of push communities away from perhaps maladaptive political practices after traumatic events and histories into ways that sort of a more forward-looking political outlooks um, that are, I guess, inspired by critical reflection upon trauma and, and from where it's emerged. So in this chapter, I propose, and it's, it's a chapter that is sort of half theoretical, half empirical. Um, it's a chapter, yeah, so in the chapter, I propose and explore the possibilities and potentials of what I call a politics of grief. So I look at, first of all, China, and these are not, I set these two cases, China and South Africa, not as, I don't want them to be seen as um, contrasts or opposites. I kind of would like them to be seen, um, although I know there's death of the author, as along a spectrum of understanding sort of responses to trauma. So on one hand, I looked at China, which, by, you know, it's not the perfect case, but um, this is inspired by my previous study of Chinese. Um, um, I look at um, China's history, the, what they call their century of national humiliation, which began um, at the start of the Opium War and really ended, say, in, at the end of World War II, but I sort of draw it to the end of uh, 1949 with the rise of um, the CCP. And uh, this, uh, I guess, I look at how representations of the century of humiliation have essentially been um, used in China's case as an overtly political tool to actually con co constitute community. So these representations, um, they, um, in, they've helped to consolidate uh, Chinese community and Chinese nationalism. Um, but I sort of look at how in doing this, in constituting community um, around uh, around sort of very, yeah, very singular representations of trauma, such was the case with the Bali bombing as well, um, how this can lead to um, retributive political practices and mindsets. So there's a lot of literature that looks at how um, trauma and traumatic legacies and histories, when they're dwelt upon and commemorated in ways that really celebrate the trauma rather than uh, reflecting upon it, <clears throat> and seeking to move forward. Um, communities are constituted, again, in very insular ways, um, in ways that lead towards actually a search for um, recognition and status. They, they would like their trauma recognised. Um, and I argue that's such the case with China. Um, and in turn, communities are really unable to move forward. They, they, they're stuck at the trauma that Vamik Vulcan calls this chosen trauma in where a community is so constituted by what's happened, by pain, um, by the emotions associated with pain, that they can't really move forward. Um, again, it's not entirely the case with China, but I do um, elaborate in the book a little bit how perhaps this can play a role or perhaps it should be considered in... Um, in, I guess, f uh, foreign policy circles, essentially. So from there, I move, the second half of the chapter moves towards South Africa. And again, not a perfect example, but I use South Africa as a sort of tool to explain and question, you know, what is it that communities, how can communities acknowledge trauma and work through trauma in a way that um, pushes them towards um, um, more forward-looking political outlooks um, and doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't um, keep them inward-looking. And so I, I look at, in particular, the truth and reconciliation in South Africa and, I, and how, as a tool, it sort of allowed the entire South African community, survivors, witnesses, bystanders, to um, collectively acknowledge and mourn what they went through and uh, I looked specifically at some of the tools um, through which they did that, and um, I argue that it might be one way of conceptualising a politics of grief. So it's one way of, of prompting communities to move, to move forward after trauma, but to reflect upon it in order to, to move forward. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Empirically extremely rich. Emotions abound. Emotions are crucial and important mm. in world politics. So if we step back from 
the in-depth cases and we step back from the book mm. as a whole in general and try to think of like what is it uh, about emotions, about trauma that is actually something that forces us to change the way in which we understand world politics. <sighs> Just to ask a hard question at the very <laughs> end. <laughs> well, I guess my book, um, it really has sort of two big um, key messages and probably one more specific. The first of all is that um, emotions are absolutely central to world politics. Um, you know, there's been growing work in this area and I draw upon and contribute to it, but um, we really need a lot more work done in the area. Um, emotions, as I show in the book, emotions are an inherent part of human life, of social life. Um, emotions help to structure the very social systems and political systems through which world politics takes place. And it's precisely because of that that we, you know, emotions underpin all forms of political um, perception, policies and behaviours and they really need, um, we really need much more work done in the area. I guess the second key point is the power of trauma in world politics and the role, the central role, traumatic trauma and traumatic legacies play in constituting communities um, and collective and in turn collective actions in world politics. Um, the third point, uh, which is probably more specific, is really about the role representations play in this process and essentially how representations and the range of discursive practices through which we interpret representations, um, how representations are central and key to um, the links between individual and collective emotions and also between uh, individual and collective trauma. So representations are central to um, shaping what seem to be individual emotions um, in very social, collective and political ways and representations are also fundamental to how um, trauma, which is experienced um, in, in such an embodied, ineffable way, can seep out and be social, collective and political. Yeah. It's fascinating talking to you because I can tell that amount of work and passion mm. and emotions that have gone <laughs> into writing this book. It's a fascinating read. Congratulations again mm. on this wonderful publication. And if Thank you, you have much, um, started getting an interest in the book, which I hope you did by listening to Emma and me talking about it, you can find the link to the book underneath this video. You can also find uh, the link to the website of the School of Political Science and International Studies if you're interested in some of the other research we are doing in here. Thank you for tuning in and see you next time.